Today I will present research uh, related to my current research project entitled uh, The Interface with the Foreign, the Soviet School of Translation, Cold War and World Literature 1945 to 1985. It is the concept of the Soviet School of Translation, as Anthony said, which will be in focus. So if you have heard anything at all about translation in the Soviet Union, you are likely to have heard this expression, the Soviet School of Translation. Do you hear me all? Back then? The Soviet School of Translation in the 1950s and 1960s became an official object of pride which has retained its high status into post-Soviet times much in the same way as the Soviet space program is still commonly regarded as a major achievement of the Soviet system. Unlike the ideological fetish of Soviet cosmonautics, however, which has been the subject of several critical studies, the Soviet school of translation is a piece of Soviet heritage which still lives on largely unquestioned and unconceptualized. What has generally been overlooked is that the concept as such has a history which needs to be studied from perspectives beyond its own self-understanding and official status. So this is what I'm going to do today, to look at it as a construct with a complex history of its own. Drawing on archival material, I will highlight what could be called a battle over the concept. And this is how my presentation will be structured. Uh, first, a general background to my project, both historically and as reflected in my previous research. Uh, then a historical analysis of the emergence and early development of the school concept. And finally, a brief translation analysis of two concrete translations followed by a conclusion. As for myself, uh, as Anthony said, I am originally a Slavist. I specialized in modern Russian literature. I wrote my dissertation at Stockholm University on uh, Boris Pasternak's novel, Dr. Zhivago, from a metapoetic perspective. As you may know, Pasternak was a prominent translator as well, and it was when writing an article on his 1940 uh, translation of Shakespeare's Hamlet that I became interested in literary translation as part of Soviet Russian culture. When I started to work on the subject, I was surprised to notice the disproportion between the obvious significance translation had in Soviet culture and the relatively scant scholarly attention given to it as a specific phenomenon in this context not only by Western scholarship, but also within Russia itself. Russian translation scholarship is, of course, vast, but often narrowly defined in linguistic terms or in <coughs> terms of literary history. Russian translation history of the Soviet period is, as the well-known translation scholar Pavel Topper noted some years ago, still largely unstudied. The reasons for this, he saw, the ideological and political sphere, and I quote him in my uh, own translation. Uh, first, because of the split of Russian literature in two branches, the Soviet one and the white immigrant, of which is what not allowed to talk. And then because of the mass repressions, which befell not only writers, but also translators, because of censorship interventions, the banning of books, etc. Today, the situation is beginning to change with conferences and publications beginning to appear. A uh, year ago, in Uppsala, we organized an international conference entitled Translation in Russian Context, Contexts, Transcultural, Translingual, and Transdisciplinary Points of Departure, to emphasize that research in this field will have to combine insights and approaches from Slavic, both Slavic and translation studies. And I know that here in Vienna, and Anthony mentioned 
if you recently had a conference organized by Larissa Schittel on East European and Russian translation theory, which is still relatively little known in the West. Viewed as a more or less coherent cultural political project, translation in the Soviet Union, which involved extra union as well as intra union translation, and stretched over the 70 years of the empire's existence may certainly be regarded as one of the largest translation enterprises the world has seen to date. It was <coughs> coherent in the sense of ideological framework, given certain fluctuations over time, of course, and centralized planning, and it was huge in terms of geographical range and the numbers of languages involved, the official number of languages indicated in the last Soviet census of 1989 amounted to 150. Already before the end of the Russian Civil War following the revolution in 1917, and this is quite basic for you, those of you familiar with Soviet history, a uh, Soviet translation enterprise of utopian dimensions was launched. Initiated in 1918 by the writer Maxim Gorky, a man with a liking for grandiose projects, it was called Simirnaya Literatura, or World Literature. Translations should give the masses access to, cult to the cultural heritage of all nations and contribute to a sense of solidarity between workers and peasants of other countries that was involved. Even if the actual output of the world literature enterprise was significantly more humble than the ambitious planning, the project was impressive enough and it led the foundation for further developments within Soviet translation, practices as well as theory, the close relationship between practice and theory in Russian translation, which has often been pointed out, emerges in part from the practical goals of theorizing translation, which were set up before the people of the World Literature Publishing House in the early 1920s. One of them was Kanye Chukovsky, who to a significant degree was to shape Soviet translation discourse for decades. During the 1920s and early 1930s, large-scale translation of Western and Oriental literature, both fiction and non-fiction, was carried out within the publishing house Academia in Leningrad, which took its additions to a new scholarly level. A prerequisite for this was the simultaneous scholarly reflection on translation, which evolved within several Soviet institutions and in close relationships with with developments in literary scholarship. As part of Soviet culture, translation was affected by the same factors, of course, as original literature and all other fields of cultural production. From 1932, culture, as you know, was a thing administrated and controlled by the state apparatus via institution, institutions such as the monopolistic creative organizations now set up, the state publishing houses, the institutions of censorship and literary criticism, of particular importance as a guiding principle for all the arts was the doctrine of socialist realism originally formulated in relation to the Soviet production of fiction and proclaimed at the first Congress of Soviet Writers in 1934 in its short formula, it reads, uh, socialist realism is the basic method of Soviet literature and literary criticism. It demands of the artist the truthful, historically concrete representation of reality in its revolutionary development. Moreover, the truthfulness and historical concreteness of the artistic representation of reality must be linked with the task of ideological transformation and education of workers in the spirit of socialism. In order to apply to other arts, this doctrine had to be translated. It was not all that clear how socialist realism was to be expressed in music, for example, 
School in Architecture or in the Art of Translation itself. My uh, research has concerned the heterogeneous functions of translation in the Soviet context. It was to create a global socialist realist canon, to create a Soviet canon of representative expressions of national minority cultures, and paradoxically, to provide work for authors unable to publish their original work. Such was at times the case with Pasternak, as you know, and quite a few other writers of his generation. My source material, prompted by the strong institutional features of Soviet translation, has been, and is still, archival documentation pertaining to the Soviet Writers Union, publishing houses, and individual translators, as well as publications in the press and other printed material. Translators were organized in the translators section of the Writers Union, the Soviet Writers Union, and uh, the translators section was officially formed in October 1934, that is after the first Congress of Soviet Writers, which had been held in August. I have tried in my research to reconstruct the translator's own first public gathering, the little known first all-union conference of translators, which was held in Moscow in January 1936. And I tried to plot the discourses in terms of which translation was articulated at the time, including that of socialist realism. This time saw the first attacks on what was called formalist translation, excessively concerned, as it was thought, with the artistic form of the original work. The term formalism was widely used in the so-called anti-formalist campaign, which from 1936 dramatically affected all the arts, but whereas it generally targeted all kinds of modernist expressions, in the field of literary translation, it acquired a specific function. At stake here was the value and function of foreigners as such. The derogatory term of literalism, bukvalism in Russian, began to be applied to various kinds of faulty translations, as it was thought. From this time on, domestication gradually came to dominate prescriptive Soviet discourse on translation. The implications of such ideologization of norms for the practices of literary translation is the focus of my current project, uh, the interface with the foreign, the Soviet School of Translation, Cold War, and World Literature. Uh, it aims to explore Russian translation of Western literature and the construction of a Soviet canon of world literature in general, with specific attention to translation ideology and contesting translation principles. Recognizing that the West is Russia's historical other in relation to which identities and self-understanding have been formed through history, the project addresses translation as Russian cultures interface with a foreign, the technical metaphor of an interface is used to emphasize that uh, translation is operative in defining how a foreign literary work is presented to readers and thus its potential for creating meaning in the target culture. In contrast to a conventional metaphor such as a window, Russian translation as a window to the West, the interface pinpoints the agency of the agents of translation, translators, editors, cri critics, censors, theorists. And here, the concept of the Soviet school of translation comes in as a potentially important factor, and it is the emergence and workings of this prescriptive concept that is the main topic of my presentation today. The concept of the Soviet school of translation originated in post-war translation discourse. During these years, the Russian Western 
other was represented largely, largely by the US and the Anglophone world in the polarization which we now <coughs> may refer to as Cold War I. Within Soviet culture, this polarization entailed a break with the 1930s and the relative openness towards Western impulses, which Katerina Clark has recently labeled its cosmopolitanism. The post-war decade, in contrast, was marked by nationalist internal priorities and the infamous struggle against cosmopolitanism, as you know. For example, the journal International Literature, which throughout the 1930s had presented translations of modern Western authors, was closed down in 1943. But somewhat paradoxically, the Soviet post-war positioning vis-a-vis -vis the West did not put an end to cultural interruption. It rather implied a continued <coughs> close contact through translation, although focus in these years, the first decade, uh, shifted to the classics of world literature. Concomitant with the inception of official xenophobic discourse was the establishment in 1946 of a Stalin Prize for Translations. Late Stalinism, traditionally regarded as the most sterile period of Soviet cultural history, saw a series of works of world literature appearing in new translations into Russian. Shakespeare's plays and sonnets, Byron's poems and Don Juan, Dickens' novels, Dante's Divine <coughs> Comedy, Cervantes' Don Quixote, and Goethe's Faust, to name just a few. It was specifically in relation to some of these works that the discourse on the Soviet School of Translation evolved within the institutional setting of the translator's section, which had been frozen during the war years. The recent activities of the section prompted professional self-scrutiny as evidenced by Andrei Fyodorov's report at one of its first meetings on the 2nd of February, 1948. Andrei Fyodorov was a Leningrad philologist and translation scholar who had co-authored the book, The Art of Translation, with Kadir Trukovsky in 1930, and published his own book on literary translation, what was in 1941. He focused his uh, 1948 talk on what he called our Soviet theory of translation, summing up what had been achieved to date and positing it in antonymic relationship to the pessimistic views of translation and uh, pessimistic views on translation, which he maintained was rooted in the ideas of Humboldt and Schleimacher, and which he argued led to a denial of the possibilities of a full value translation and to a formalistic, mechanistic approach to translation. As examples of such pessimistic views, he cites representatives of Russian modernism, modernism of the 1910s, such as the Symbolists and the Akhmatists. Fyodorov's statement emphasized the Russian Soviet theory of translation as a completely new phenomenon in the philological discipline worldwide. Its uh, characteristic traits were, according to Fyodorov, a recognition and dialectical substantiation of the principle of translatability and of adequacy of translation, evaluation of a translation from the point of view of its functional and semantic correspondence, so that is clear with the original, not only formal coincidence, a systematic use of facts <coughs> from the history of literature and language and other humanistic scholarship. Apart from these points, Fyodorov found it necessary, he pointed out, to stress that a characteristic trait of our theory of translation is the lack of narrowly evaluative dogmatism and the breadth of evaluative perspectives. 
He went on to mention Russian translated ships of different orientation, what we today would call domesticating as well as foreignizing ones. He, it is an indisputable fact, he concluded, that our theory of translation recognizes both possibilities as equal in practice, and the theoretical substantiation of this claim is one of its unsolved tasks. Such a non-normative stance set Fyodorov apart from most Soviet theorizing, both before and after, and it also became a topic for discussion during the meeting. To the audience, in 1948, Fyodorov's point were uh, familiar from his 1941 book. A new tonality, however, could be discerned in the conclusion of his talk, when he called upon translation critics in the first place to denounce, I quote, every kind of cocktailing before foreign scholarship and literature, Mr. Pakmonska, and excessive reverence for other languages, here, translation discourse is clearly informed by the general shift in Soviet cultural politics towards the end of the 1940s, known as Zdanovism, Zdanovshina. This austere term, named after Central Committee Secretary Andrei Zdanov, entailed a tightening of party control over the cultural production involving xenophobic and anti-modernist, anti-formalist campaigns. A month after <coughs> the order of speech, on the 11th of March, 1948, the translators section held a discussion about a new translation of Byron's Don Juan. Uh, the translator was Giorgi Shengili, who was also a prolif prolific poet and uh, of classical orientation, but not published after 1935, and literary scholar. Byron was held by official uh, Soviet views to be a progressive romantic, and Shengili had pre previously translated his poems, which appeared in two volumes in 1940, in connection with the poet's 150th anniversary in in an afterword to Don Juan, Shengili explains his translation principles, taking his critical point of departure in the most widespread translation of Don Juan at the time, uh, Pavel Kozlov's version from 1888, which he deems extremely inexact. At the, uh, the basic at the basis of Schengen's professed method and translation philosophy is a concern for the effect a translation produces in the target culture, put forward here as a theory of functional similarity. The choice of meters in the target language should be guided by a concern that it be functionally approximate to the original meter in terms of genre and character being at the same time perceived as, quote, our own meter easy and natural, unquote. In order to preserve the rich lexical content of Byron's verse, and at the same time its light, ironic conversational tone, Shengili proposes to substitute iambic hexometer for Byron's iambic pentometer, arguing that in this case, it is a Russian functional equivalent. The discussion about the new Don Juan translation was introduced by a highly appreciative talk given by a member of the section. Among the overall positive responses to the translation and to the introduction, some critical remarks were made by Ivan Kashkin, translator of American and English literature and head of the translated section at the time. Kashkin first criticized Shingiri's addition for the absence of a foreword that would provide quote, a general understanding of Byron, unquote, and determine the respective degrees of his progressiveness and conservatism, recalling that Karl Marx had said that if Byron had lived longer than his 36 years, he would have become a reactionary bourgeois. 
Kashkin also criticized the speaker's claim that the figure of the great Russian field marshal Suvorov in Byron's work came through to the Russian reader in all of his humble and wise greatness. This claim was, according to Kashkin, based on one felicitous phrase, he made no answer but took the city. While there were several other lines pertaining to the Russian field marshal, which were, quote, significantly less felicitous, particularly in translation, unquote. But the main mistake in the introductory talk was, according to Kashkin, the application of the term, the Soviet school of translation, to Shingen's Don Juan. The attempt to, quote, canonize Shengeli's translation principles as the principles of the Soviet school of translation. Unquote. As for the translation itself, Kashkin found the search for radical devices, as he said, was the which in the end uh, led to wordplay in the need of commentary to be most unacceptable. The main cause of all shortcomings in Shengeli's translation was according to Kashkin, the urge for exactness, fortuneness. I quote, everything is exact. Everything is seemingly in place, but in many stanzas this in place is reminiscent of how in numerous Moscow apartments the gas heater is in place, but for a long time there is no heating fuel. The functional approach advocated by Shengele in his afterward, which was in fact quite consonant with Fyodorov's theoretical position, was not discussed at all by Kashkir. An important event in the further development of the discourse on the Soviet school was a conference held in October-November 1950 and dedicated to the tasks of Soviet translations of word classics. Here, the keynote speaker, uh, Nikolai William Wilmond, a journalist and translator, attempted to connect the sphere of Soviet translation to Stalin's recent statements about language in the article Marxism and Problems of Linguistics, which had been published in Pravda on the 20th of June 1950. This step had broad implications for the field, echoing Stalin's Marxist terminology, Wilmont argued that, quote, since language is different from the superstructure, unquote, and does not automatically change along with the base, there are no sudden language revolutions. And hence, quote, our language is principally the same as Pushkin's, admittedly with an enlarged vocabulary. In light of Stalin's foregrounding of the continuity of language, the earlier Russian translation tradition and the new Soviet one were indissolubly linked. This implicitly <coughs> created a possibility for Bilman to include old, mostly domesticating translations in the Soviet canon. Soviet translators, Bilman declared, followed the old traditions. Earlier quoted translations by Pushkin, Lermontov, Krupovsky, Kurichkin, Alexei Tolstoy, as well as prose translations by Dostoevsky and Turgenev, were claimed as predecessors of the Soviet school. This re-evaluation re of 19th century Russian translations was not advantageous for Shengili, who, as I mentioned, based his critical afterward to the exact Don Juan on an elaborated critique of Pavel Kozlov's 1888 translation. Although Shengili's Don Juan was not mentioned in this keynote speech, it became a central issue of the conference, much to the surprise of the translator himself, as the topic had not been brought up since the first discussion almost three years earlier. It was now, now virulently attacked by Ivan Kashkin, who claimed that Shengili had especially distorted the picture of Field Marshal Suvorov and the Russian soldiers in Byron's work. In defense, Shengili argued 
that the negative intonations for which he was criticized were not only present in Byron's original text, they were also found in the now revered earlier translation by Kozlov, which had not prompted any indignation on the part of Kashkin. In his speech, Kashkin also somewhat contradictorily denounced the method by which Factographical exactness blurred the ideological and artistic significance of the work, resulting in, quote, verse translation without poetry, verse translation without emotional coloring, without sincere and deep feeling, <coughs> in short, without artistic charm. <coughs> Furthermore, he targeted the shortcomings of contemporary criticism, exemplified by the excessive praise in the introductory speech in 1948, which allowed for translations such as Chinginis to appear in the first place. Therefore, he held, even if, if at this point the principles of the Soviet school had been consolidated in hard struggle, this is a quote, against alien hostile positions inherited from decadence in formalism and the hackwork or attitudes of the left period, and the enemy had been defeated, the fight for the concept <coughs> of the Soviet school had to be continued. It is necessary, Kashkin said, to resist all attempts to vulgarize, banalize, and falsify the very concept of the principles of the Soviet translation and the Soviet school of and the school of Soviet translation. Attempts at passing off as its own achievements works which are alien to the very essence of this concept. The general characteristics of Shengelis Dangerous as defined by Kashkin at the conference in in the autumn of 1950, that is un-Soviet, un-poetic, and unpatriotic in its treatment of the civil of the, were from now on repeated from one context to another. The annual report of the section for the year 1950 mentions Schengelis Byron as a relapse of formalism in which, quote, a preoccupation with outworn virtuosity and exotica had led to a number of distortions of the original imagery, in particular resulting in a lowering of the image of Soborov and his soldiers in comparison with the English text. Over the following years, Kashkin continued to attack formalism in translation during discussions at the section focusing on Shangili's poetry and also on prose translations by Evgeny Lang, a prominent translator of Dickens. The same rhetoric by which Soviet translation was defined in contrast to unpatriotic tendencies in Shengelis and Lang's translation practice was applied in press articles by Kashkin from 1951 and 1952. In the article, on the language of translation published in the literary Gazette, on the 1st of December 1951, Kashkin singled out both Trengeli and Lan as representing, I quote, a stronghold of literalism and linguistic foreignness. Their translations reflected bourgeois decadent disintegration, Raspat, manifested in the corruption of the national language in favor of foreign languages and linguistic acrobatics." In 1953, Kashkin lectured to the translator section <coughs> on the theme of remnants of formalism in literary translation. And this speech was discussed at two meetings held on 11th February and 4th, March, 4th of March. The letter took place in the tense atmosphere that arose in the wake of the news about Comrade Stalin's disease he was infected by the following day. 
In the nature and various expressions of formalism were commented upon by a number of members. Here, Kengili and Lang, neither of whom were present, were attacked again as the main exponents of the objectionable practice. This was the apogee of anti-formalist anti rhetoric within the translated section. Here, Kashkin declared, formalism in the theory and practice of translation is an anti-copy, anti-realist, anti-democratic, reactionary translation for the sake of translation, rooted in an idealistic outlook and detached from life, from the, <coughs> the current reality and from the people and its demands. The general picture of the formalists constructed by Kashkin in this and other speeches, as well as articles at the time, implied the practices of Kagili and Lang in particular, resonates with several topics within the anti-cosmopolitanism discourse. Kashkin's own principles for realist translation, which was his preferred method for the Soviet school, as led out in his articles of the time, were obviously designed to echo the formula of socialist realism <coughs> as the method for, for the production of original literature. The best Soviet translators are aware of the great significance of artistic translation as one of the forms of Soviet literary production and of their great responsibility towards the reader. They do not deny the benefits of preliminary analysis of the text, but they have a different understanding of the method and goal of it. They strive to clarify for themselves <coughs> and for the readers the ideological and artistic essence of the work being translated in order to determine the principal and important elements which are interesting and important in our times too, that which is progressive and ought to be translated in the first place. According to Kashkin, the translator had to convey not the text of the original literary work, but the reality which, according to Leninist aesthetics, was mirrored in this work. The typical traits of reality as seen by the author, the original author, and rendered in forms accessible to the Soviet reader. Although these precepts for the Soviet school of translation were subsequently both criticized and modif modified by various scholars. Kashkin is even today a much revered authority in Russian translation theory. In the final part of my work, of my talk, I will return to the question of the implications of such ideologization of norms for the practices of literary translation. I have made a comparative reading of Shengiri's rendering of Don Juan with uh, the translation of the same work which eventually entered the Soviet canon, namely the famous version carried out by Tatiana Gnidich and issued in 1959. I will attempt a comparative microanalysis of the beginning of Canto <coughs> 10 of Byron's <coughs> novel in verse. Uh, this is an uh, ironic philosophic digression, so typical of his style. So I'll just read it. Well, when Newton saw an apple fall, he found in that slight startle from his contemplation. Tis said, for I'll not, I'll not answer about ground for any stages, creed, or calculation, a mode of growing that the earth turned round in the most natural world called gravitation. And this is the sole mortal who could grapple since Adam with a fall or with an apple. Man fell with apples and with apples rose if this be true, for we must deem then the mode in which Sir Isaac Newton could disclose through the then unpaid stars the turnpike road, a thing to counterbalance human woes, 
For ever since immortal man hath flowed with all kinds of mechanics, and full soon steam engines will conduct him to the moon. <coughs> Here Byron plays with the notions of fall and apple as common constituents in two cultural founding myths, one religious, the other secular. The biblical fall caused by the consumption of the fruit of knowledge is juxtaposed to Newton's discovery of the universal gravitation, prompted by the fall of an apple, which, <coughs> which by this token also metamorphoses into a fruit of knowledge. Newton, according to Byron, and did the biblical fall this digression on the existential predicament of man presents some interesting problems for translators working in the Soviet context. Man, Shalaviak, was a central ideology in the pronounced anti-religious Soviet culture. It was a word that sounded proudly in Maxim Gorky's iconic phrase, the new man brought about by the revolution and called the Soviet man was a cornerstone of Bolshevik rhetoric. The sententious phrase on man, which concludes the second octave, is handled very differently by the two translators. Here is Shingele. For ever since a motor man has flown, with all kinds of mechanics <coughs> and small soul steam engines were conducted to the moon. Uh, Shagini renders Byron's immortal man with its philosophical and religious connotations quite literally. And this is a clumsy back translation from uh, uh, Shagini's translation. And once immortal man became a friend of the skies, and with the help of a skillful invention, launched machines, the steam will very soon carry us to the moon. In, uh, in Gnedic, we have, uh, and it, that is Newton's invention, gave the suffering a new way out very soon. We, the masters of nature, will send our steam engines even to the moon. Gnidich replaces the collocation immortal man with the inclusive we, we, and the apposition masters of nature. In the original translation, Lestitili Irlov. This addition is a Soviet cliché which foregrounds one specific aspect of the ideological complex of man in Soviet discourse, man as master of nature and life. Nidic not only changes the perspective from generic man to the collective and inclusive we, she also modifies the uh, agency in the sentence. In Byron and Trengele, the subject is the steam, the steam engines and steam, respectively, steam engines will conduct him to the moon, the steam will very soon carry us to the moon. In Gnedic, it is we masters of nature who will send our steam engines even to the moon. We have here a syntactic illustration to the supremacy of man. By the time of the publication of Gnedic's translation in 1950, the space theme had gained another actuality than it had in the beginning of the 1940s. The first Sputnik was successfully launched on the 4th of October 1947, and the space race had begun. Journey to the Moon had become an ideology in which it was not at the time of Schengeli's translation, 1941 to 1943, and the cosmonaut was the new man incarnated. In later editions of Gnedic's version, we find a further update where the steam is deleted altogether. Soon, we, the masters of nature, will send our machines to the moon. This semantic shift lends Byron's sci-fi assumptions even more prophetic and progressive 
force. Nidic thus firmly inscribes Byron into a Soviet post war discourse. I would argue that her translation is as an interface with the foreign was deliberately designed with an eye to the pre previous arguments about the Soviet school. And this is based on a lot of other examples, not only this one. Her translation was originally produced almost simultaneously with Shangelis while she was incarcerated in the Leningrad prison in 1944 to 1946 and subsequently held in correction camps for eight years. But it went through a long process of editorial work in which Nedic took active part herself ten years after its original completion. At that time, not only Shangelis translation, but also the critical discourse surrounding it was part of the context serving as a memento for any translator dealing with Byron. Gnedic's editor has left an account of their joint work which suggests at least some familiarity with the preceding translation. She writes, when we got completely tired, Tatiana Gligulina Gnedic proposed an amusement Let's look this up in Shangeli. We found the place in the text, read it, and had great fun. Nidic's Don Joel is widely admired for its smoothness and readability. <coughs> However, due to the ambition to keep the conformity <coughs> of the original, she is forced to significant collisions, which are often combined with additions of an explanatory character. This Pedagogical trust, together with paraphrasing and normalization, contributes to a domesticating tendency in Nietzsche's work, which is in agreement with some of the principles of the realist translation of the Soviet school. And it was as an example of this school that it was subsequently promoted by prominent Soviet critics, such as Etkin and Tchaikovsky. When Shingilis Dongeron Appeared only once, Nedicis has seen 11 editions to the eight, six Soviet ones and five post Soviet ones. And uh, I'll now go on to my conclusion. Uh, the history of the Soviet school of translation as a concept is intimately linked to questions of power and ideology in post war Soviet culture as they materialized in the environment of professional translators. As my analysis suggests, the discourse on the Soviet school of translation was instrumental in forming the Soviet translation of canon after World War II. The development of the Soviet school of translation as a concept was so intertwined with Ivan Kashkin and his circle, that is his own school, that they became nearly synonymous. The wave of translations of American literature during the fall period, many of them carried out by talented former members of the Kashkin group, and particularly the canonization of Hemingway, brought new stages to Kashkin's name. He was himself a Hemingway scholar and prefaced the famous Soviet two volume edition of Hemingway in 1959. The Belgian scholar, Christian Baru, recounts that at uh, the translation conference at the Moscow State Linguistic University in 2002, Professor Maria Litvinova, who is well known today as one of the translators of Harry Potter, uh, told him, Nous sommes tous des Kashkiniens. Kashkin left an imprint on Soviet translation discourse, which is still felt in Russia today perhaps not so much in terms of his theory of realist translation as in the common negative attitudes towards, towards what he, Kashkin, defined as literalist translation and in the lasting difficulties of discussing the value and function of foreignness in translation in a non-normative way. When appreciating the achievements of the school, Soviet school of translation, 
many of them truly outstanding in terms of their cultural significance in the Russian context, it is necessary to remember what was excluded in the name of the concept and defined as its other. That is what we have translation history for, I think. So,